Today we're introducing a very important concept, that's the idea of linearly independent vectors. We'll begin with some motivation, then we'll see the definition, some examples, and the theorem that we'll use in order to show that a set of vectors is linearly independent, and we'll do an example of using it. Beginning with some motivation. In R squared, every vector can be uniquely expressed in terms of what we call the standard basis vectors, i and j. i is the vector 1, 0, j is the vector 0, 1. And if we have any vector, x, y, in R squared, we can certainly express it as a linear combination of i and j. It would just be x times i plus y times j pretty straightforward. And again, this is unique. Every vector can be expressed uniquely like this. For example, 2, 3 can be expressed uniquely as a linear combination of i and j. It's just 2i plus 3j. But what would happen if we added an additional axis to this two-dimensional space? Say we add this axis w that makes a 45-degree angle with the x and y axes. Now, the unit vector along the x-axis is i, 1, 0. The unit vector along the y-axis is j, 0, 1. The unit vector along this new w-axis, if you remember your unit circle, you might know the unit vector would be root 2 over 2, root 2 over 2. Now, what happens to our expressions of vectors in R squared? Well, taking this same vector as before, 2, 3, there are now many ways that we could write it. We could mostly ignore the w-axis and write 2, 3 as this linear combination, 2i plus 3j, just like before, but now plus 0w. Or we could write it as i plus 2j plus root 2w. Notice how multiplying w by root 2 would give us 2 over 2 and 2 over 2, so that would just be adding 1 to the x and y components which is why this equation is true. This is 1i plus root 2w. That's going to be 1 plus 1 in the x component to give us 2. And 2j plus root 2w will give us 2 plus 1 in the y component, giving us 3. We could also write 2, 3 like this. 3i plus 4j minus root 2w. In this case, we are subtracting 1 from the x and y component when we subtract root 2w. And so again, the equation is true. Now, we've got multiple representations of 2, 3, and in fact, we could construct infinitely many representations of the vector 2, 3 in this system where we have this third axis. And this is not a good thing. This introduces unnecessary complication. It's very nice when a vector has a unique representation in terms of the standard basis vectors. By introducing this unnecessary third axis, we introduce a bunch of complication. All of a sudden, now every vector can be expressed infinitely many ways. That's not great, and that motivates our definition. What we had between i and j, and have lost by introducing w, is linear independence between our vectors i and j are linearly independent. They can't be expressed in terms of each other. But once we introduce w, these three vectors are no longer linearly independent. So what does that mean? Let's see the definition. If s is a set of two or more vectors in a space v, then s is said to be a linearly independent set if no vector in s can be expressed as a linear combination of the others. Otherwise, S is said to be a linearly dependent set. In the case that S has only one vector, we will consider S to be linearly independent if and only if its one vector is non-zero. So that's what it means for a set of vectors to be linearly independent. It means that no vector in the set can be expressed as a linear combination of the others. Now let's see how this example violated that. It's easy to see from what w equals that we could express it as root 2 over 2 times i plus root 2 over 2 times j. 
So once we introduce W, we lose linear independence, and that's what's causing this problem. So here's one more look at that definition. Next, we'll take a look at the theorem we'll typically use to show that a set of vectors is linearly independent. Here it is. A non-empty set, S, in a vector space V is linearly independent if and only if the only coefficients satisfying this equation are 0, 0, 0, and so on. So the only solution to this equation is the trivial solution. Now, what does this have to do with linear independence? Well, if the set of vectors is not linearly independent, then we could express one vector in terms of some others and then subtract them and get 0. So there would be a non-trivial solution to this equation if the vectors were not linearly independent. We could add them up in such a way that they cancel out. If they are linearly independent, that would not be possible. So the only way we could combine the vectors to get zero would be if we multiplied them all by zero because there's no way that we can express one of them in terms of the others if they're independent. An easy example of linearly independent vectors is the standard basis vectors in Rn. These are typically denoted E1, E2, up through En. Each one of these vectors has all zeros except in one component. E1 has a one in the first component, E2 has a one in the second component, En has a one in the nth component, and so on. How do we know that these standard basis vectors are linearly independent? Well, from the previous theorem, this is the relevant equation. So this is an arbitrary linear combination of the standard basis vectors, and this should equal zero only when all of the coefficients are zero. That's what it would mean for the vectors to be linearly independent. Now, for this vector on the left to equal the zero vector, the first component, for example, must equal zero. The first component is completely determined by this first term with E1, because E1 is the only vector here that has a non-zero first component. So the first component of this vector on the left is going to be k1. So k1 must equal 0. Similarly, we can argue that k2 must equal 0 because that will tell us what the second component is. That's got to be 0. And so on. All the way up through kn, all of these coefficients must be 0. Hence, the vectors are linearly independent. The only way to combine them and get 0 is to multiply them all by zero. All right, let's do a more general example. Here's a set S of vectors in R cubed. How do we determine if this set is linearly independent? Well, again, we're going to use that theorem. We consider an arbitrary linear combination of the vectors in the set and set it equal to zero. We then need to determine if this equation has non-trivial solutions or not. If it does have a non-trivial solution, then in fact, the vectors are linearly dependent. But if the only solution is the trivial one, the vectors are linearly independent. Now, replacing v1, v2, and v3 here with what they actually are equal to, we get this equation. k1 times v1 plus k2 times v2 plus k3 times v3. This equation then leads to this matrix equation. Here are the coefficients, 1, 3, 1, 0, 1, 2, 1, 0, negative 5, those are the components of these three vectors. And of course, it's getting multiplied by this column vector with the variables k1, k2, and k3, and this must equal the zero vector. To determine if this equation has non-trivial solutions, there are two strategies. We could use Gauss-Jordan elimination. If we're able to reduce the coefficient matrix to the identity, that will show that the only solution is the trivial solution, k1, k2, k3, all equal to zero. On the other hand, we could calculate the determinant. If the determinant of this matrix is non-zero, then that will also establish that the only solution is the trivial solution. I'll show you how to do this using both strategies. So if we use Gauss-Jordan, this is the coefficient matrix. We don't really have to worry about the constants because they're all zero. If we perform Gauss-Jordan elimination, you can verify that we arrive at this matrix. And you see there is a row of zeros. So in fact, we have a free variable here. That's K3 is going to be free. 
and that tells us that we are going to have non-trivial solutions. Since we didn't get the identity matrix when we performed Gauss-Jordan elimination, it's not the case that the set of vectors is linearly independent. There are non-trivial solutions to this equation, so the vectors are in fact linearly dependent. And the work we did here tells us that we could pick any value we like for K3, and then we could pick K2 and K1 accordingly, and we would have a non-trivial solution to this equation. It's possible to combine these three vectors in a non-trivial way so that they cancel out. So they are not linearly independent. They are linearly dependent. Now if we use the determinant, we would end up getting a zero determinant, which tells us the relevant homogeneous system has non-trivial solutions. If the determinant was non-zero, we would have only one solution, the trivial solution. But the determinant is zero, so that means there are non-trivial solutions. To calculate the determinant here, you can see that I used a cofactor expansion across the first row. There are other ways you could have gone about it. I'll leave links in the description to various ways to calculate the determinant if you need to review. So in a nutshell, how do you determine if a set of vectors in Rn is linearly independent? It comes down to this. You can construct the matrix whose columns are the components of the vectors in question, 131, 131, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, and so on, and then you can perform Gauss-Jordan elimination. If you get the identity, then that means the only solution to the relevant equation is the trivial solution, and so the vectors are linearly independent. Alternatively, you can calculate the determinant of the same matrix that we just discussed, and if you get a non-zero determinant, then again, the vectors are linearly independent. Otherwise, if Gauss-Jordan leads to not the identity, or the determinant is zero, then the set of vectors is linearly dependent. I'll leave links in the description to videos where we do some more practice of determining if vectors in Rn are linearly independent or not, but we'll leave it here for now. That's what linearly independent vectors are, some examples, and the critical theorem that we generally use to determine if a set of vectors is linearly independent. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions, and be sure to check out my linear algebra course and linear algebra exercises playlist in the description for more. If you want to help support what I do and get access to more linear algebra practice, please consider joining Wrath of Math as a channel member. You can access the solutions video for five more problems concerning linear independence of a set of vectors, so be sure to check that out in the description if it interests you. You can also get access to other early and exclusive videos and access to the lecture notes that I use in the series. Thanks for watching. Uh, uh, I'm the mathematical menace, the machinations of mankind. Two calculators at the same time, hand signs and abacus, finger count and calculus. I'm the V to the T, my parameter, the rapidest. Happens like this, my lectures, the most prominent, dominant. Call me the Morgan, I get the compliments. The union in together like any time that we intersect, cause my opponents know they need.